The imposing building behind me, located across from the village of Athens, across the Hawking River on ridges high above the city, was known as the Athens Lunatic Asylum when it opened in 1874. During its 119 years of operation, the Athens Asylum treated tens of thousands of people from Civil War veterans to doctors, lawyers, housewives, farmers. It was really a remarkable departure because it was the creation of what became to be known as the Moral Treatment Era. Prior to this period, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the mentally ill were locked up in prisons, they were kept in jails, they were kept in people's attics, or they were just homeless or in poor houses. They were the people society did not want to be seen, and they were not seen because they were kept away or locked away. Moral treatment turned that around dramatically, even though only for a short period, because it allowed people to be in a facility that was large, airy, comfortable, rather homelike. There was not a lot of treatment per se, but by the same token, they had a much better environment to live in than they ever had before. The innovator of the asylum was Thomas Story Kirkbride. He was a Pennsylvania Quaker physician who came to believe that the way to treat people with mental illness was not with shackles, but with kindness. So he designed this building that we're in, the Athens Asylum, and hundreds of others across the country with wide open corridors, very high ceilings, lots of windows that let in light and air, and all kinds of activities for the patients to do. It was a very remarkable era of moral treatment because people, even though they didn't have medicines and they didn't have the kind of therapies that we have today, they were well treated, which was a distinct contrast to what they had been before. The hospital thrived for many years in that period of moral treatment, but there weren't many real cures. There were very few medications. The Kirkbride philosophy was, of course, to have people have open space for things to do and recreation, but there also had to be some sort of treatment. So they opened a training school for nurses, which was quite a development in those days. Netta Mapes was the, one of the first nurses to graduate from this school, and we have her diary, and in her diary of her training, they taught her how to use various remedies on patients, including cocaine, cannabis, and blood-sucking leeches, among other things. Over a period of time, moving on into the 1950s, things were getting worse because there was warehousing, they didn't have a lot to do, and so some very barbaric, we would call them, practices were started. One of them was by Dr. Walter Freeman, who was the inventor of what we would certainly consider an inhumane practice called transorbital lobotomy. A transorbital lobotomy eventually involved, yes, believe it or not, an ice pick that was inserted in the upper eye into the patient's brain and then twisted. That process, he thought, would interrupt some of the bad behavior that he thought caused mental illness. Dr. Walter Freeman, who was the ice pick lobotomist, as he was known, came to Athens over a period of six years and did about 200 lobotomies. At times, he would be doing 20 lobotomies in a single day. You've got to remember that Dr. Freeman, while he was a physician, was a neurologist and was not a surgeon, and yet performed these terribly inhumane practices. I have sent to the Congress today a series of proposals to help fight mental illness and mental retardation. It has troubled our national conscience, but only as a problem unpleasant to mention, easy to postpone, and despairing of solution. At a time period when things were changing radically in the United States in the 1960s, President Kennedy was the first one to have the idea that we should be putting people in treatment into the community rather than in large warehouse asylums like this. That was kind of the beginning of the end for the large asylums because that is when they started moving the community to treat people. And in fact, this hospital closed and a newer, modern facility was open and is open to this day.
What unfortunately has happened, however, is that even though we have great advances in drug treatment, we have great advances in cognitive therapy and counseling that help people with mental illness, what we don't have is enough resources so Ohio can fulfill its mission of treating the mentally ill like they do people with physical illnesses.